two, one. This is as close as we can get to the base of the World Trade Center. You can see the firemen assembled here, the police officers, FBI agents, and you can see the two towers. A huge explosion now raining debris on all of us. We better get out of the way! staff entered the classroom and told Mr. Bush, the nation is under attack. Not knowing what to do, with no one telling him what to do, and no Secret Service rushing in to take him to safety, Mr. Bush just sat there and continued to read My Pet Goat with the children. Seven minutes passed with nobody doing anything. At this hour, American and coalition forces are in the early stages of military operations to disarm Iraq, to free its people, and to defend the world from grave danger. On my orders, coalition forces have begun striking selected targets of military importance to undermine Saddam Hussein's ability to wage war. These are opening stages of what will be a broad and concerted campaign. More than a decade later, the U.S. is still fighting in Afghanistan. For year after year after year, with 120, 150,000 troops on the ground. I have determined that it is in our vital national interest to send an additional 30,000 U.S. troops to Afghanistan so that they can target the insurgency and secure key population centers. On my orders, the United States military has begun strikes against Al-Qaeda terrorist training camps and military installations of the Taliban regime in Afghanistan. been killed from barrel bombings in Syria. Here, a lucky escape from a two-month-old baby following a barrel bomb attack in Aleppo in July. Still, the American death toll in Afghanistan is less than half that from the war in Iraq. The U.S. military effort there ended in December 2011. 
in Iraq, you had a much larger force go in in a much more violent way initially than you had in Afghanistan, and then that large force stayed. This is tape one of three tapes on the New Order of Barbarians, referred to on these tapes as simply the New World System. Tapes one and two are reminiscent by Dr. Lawrence Dunnigan of a speech given on March 20th, 1969 by an insider of the order, whose names and credentials are given in the interview with Dr. Dunnigan on tape three. The moderator for these tapes is Randy Engel, National Director, U.S. Coalition for Life. There has been much written and much said by some people who have looked at all the changes that have occurred in American society in the past 20 years or so, and who have looked then retrospectively to earlier history of the United States and indeed of the world and come to the conclusion that there is a that there is a conspiracy of sorts <clears throat> which influences indeed controls major historical events not only in the United States but around the world this conspiratorial interpretation of history is based on people making observations from the outside gathering evidence and coming to the conclusion that from the outside they see a conspiracy. Their evidence and conclusion are based on evidence gathered in retrospect, period. I want to now describe what I heard from the speaker in 1969, which in several weeks will now be 20 years ago. The speaker did not speak in terms of retrospect, but rather predicting changes that would be brought about in the future. The speaker was not looking from the outside in, thinking that he saw conspiracy. Rather, he was on the inside, admitting that indeed there was an organized power force, group of men, who wielded enough influence to determine major events involving countries around the world, and he predicted or uh, rather expounded on uh, changes that were planned for the remainder of this century. As you listen, if you can recall the situation, at least in the United States in 1969 and the few years thereafter, and then recall the kinds of changes which have occurred between then and now, almost 20 years later. I believe you'll be impressed with the degree to which the things that were planned to be brought about have already been accomplished. Some of the things that uh, were discussed uh, were not intended to be accomplished yet by 1988, uh, but are intended to be accomplished uh, before the end of this century. There is a timetable, and uh, it was during this uh, session that uh, that some of the elements of the timetable were brought out. Uh, anyone who recalls Early uh, in the days of the Kennedy presidency, uh, the Kennedy campaign, when he spoke of progress in the decade of the 60s, that was kind of a cliche in those days, the decade of the 60s. Well, by 1969, our speaker was talking about the decade of the 70s, the decade of the 80s, 
in the decade of the 90s. So that uh, I think that terminology, that way of looking and uh, looking at things and expressing things, probably um, all comes from the same source. Prior to that time, I don't remember anybody saying the decade of the 40s and the decade of the 50s. So I think this uh, overall plan and timetable uh, had taken important shape with more predictability to those who control it uh, sometime in the late 50s. That's speculation on my part. In any event, the speaker said that <clears throat> His purpose was to tell us about changes which would be brought about in the next uh, 30 years or so, so that an entirely new worldwide system would be in operation before the turn of the century. As he put it, uh, we plan to enter the 21st century with a running start. He said as we listened to what he was about to present, he said, some of you will think I'm talking about communism. Well, what I'm talking about is much bigger than communism. Um, at that time, he indicated there is much more cooperation between East and West than most people realize. In his introductory remarks, he commented that uh, he was free to speak at this time. He would not have been able to say what he was about to say even a few years earlier, but he was free to speak at this time because now, and I'm quoting here, everything is in place and nobody can stop us now. That's the end of that quotation. He went on to say that most people don't understand how governments operate, and even people in high positions in governments, including our own, don't really understand how and where decisions are made he went on to say that um, he went on to say that the people who really influence decisions are names that, for the most part, would be familiar to most of us. But he would not use individuals' names or names of any specific organizations. But that if he did, most of the people would be names that were recognized by most uh, of his audience. He went on to say that they were not primarily people in public office, but uh, people of prominence who were primarily known in their uh, private occupations or private positions. The speaker was a doctor of medicine, a former professor at a large Eastern University, and he was addressing a group of doctors of medicine, about 80 in number. Uh, his name would not be widely recognized by anybody likely to hear this, and so there's no point in giving his name. The only purpose in recording this is that uh, it may give a perspective to those who hear it regarding the changes which have already been uh, accomplished in the past 20 years or so, and a bit of a preview to what at least some people are planning for the remainder of this century so that we or they would enter the 21st century with a flying start. Some of us may not enter that century. His purpose in telling our group about these changes that were to be brought about uh, was to make it easier for us to adapt to these changes. Indeed, as he quite accurately said, uh, they would be changes that uh, would be very surprising and in some ways uh, difficult for people to accept. And he hoped that uh, we, as sort of his friends, would uh, make the adaptation more easily if we knew somewhat beforehand what, uh, what to expect. Somewhere in the introductory remarks, he insisted that nobody have a tape recorder and that nobody take notes, which for a professor was a very remarkable kind of thing to uh, expect from an audience. Something in his remarks suggested that uh, there could be negative repercussions against him if his if it became widely known uh, what he was about to say to, 
to our group, it became widely known that indeed he had spilled the beans, so to speak. Um, when I first heard that, I thought maybe that was sort of an ego trip, somebody enhancing uh, his own importance. But as the uh, revelations unfolded, I began to understand why he might have had some concern about not having it widely known what was said, although this, although this was a fairly public forum where he was speaking. Remarks were delivered, but nonetheless he asked that uh, no notes be taken, no tape recorder be used, uh, suggesting there might be some personal danger to himself uh, if these revelations were uh, widely publicized. Again, as the remarks began to unfold and some of the rather outrageous things that were said at that time, they certainly seemed outrageous, uh, I made it a point to try to remember as much of what he said as I could and during the subsequent weeks and months and years to connect my recollections to simple events around me, uh, both to aid my memory for the future, in case I wanted to do what I'm doing now, record this, and also to uh, try to maintain a perspective on what would be developing if indeed it followed the predicted pattern, which it has at this point, so that I don't forget to uh, include it later. I'll just include some statements that were made from time to time throughout the presentation, um, just having a general bearing on the, the whole presentation. One of the statements was having to do with change. Uh, people get used, the statement was, people will have to get used to the idea of change. So used to change that uh, they'll be expecting change. Nothing will be permanent. This often came out in the context of a society of uh, where, where people seem to have no roots or, or moorings, uh, but would be passively willing to accept change simply because that was all they had ever known. This was sort of in contrast to uh, generations of people up until this time where certain things you expect to be and remain in place uh, as reference points for your life. So change was to be brought about, change was to be anticipated and expected and accepted, no questions asked. Another comment that was made uh, from time to time during the presentation was, people are too trusting. People don't ask the right questions. Sometimes being too trusting was equated with being too dumb. But sometimes when, when he would say that and say, people don't ask the right questions, uh, it was almost with a sense of regret as if he were uneasy with what uh, he was a part of and wished that uh, people would challenge it and uh, maybe not be so trusting. Another comment that was repeated from time to time, uh, this particularly in relation to changing laws and customs and uh, specific changes, he said, everything has two purposes. One is the ostensible purpose, which will make it acceptable to people. And second is the real purpose, uh, which would further the goals of establishing the new system and having it. Frequently, he would say, there's no other way. There's just no other way. This seemed to uh, come as a, sort of an apology, uh, particularly when at the conclusion of uh, describing some particularly offensive changes, for example, uh, the promotion of drug addiction, which we'll get into shortly. He was very active with population control groups, the population control movement, and population control was really the entry point into specifics following the introduction. Uh, he said the population is growing too fast numbers uh, of people living at any one time on the planet must be limited or we will run out of space to live. We will outgrow our food supply and we will over pollute the world with our waste. 
people won't be allowed to have babies just because they want to or because they are careless. Most families would be limited to two. Some people would be allowed only one, and the outstanding person or persons might be selected uh, and allowed to have three, but most people would allow to have uh, only two babies. That's because the zero population growth uh, is 2.1 children per completed family, so something like every tenth family might be allowed the privilege of the third baby. To me, up to this point, the word population control uh, primarily connoted uh, limiting the number of babies to be born, but uh, this remark about what people would be allowed and then what followed made it quite clear that when you hear population control, that means more than just controlling births. It means control of every endeavor of, an enti of the entire world population. Uh, a much broader meaning to that term than I had uh, ever attached to it before hearing this. As you listen and reflect back on uh, some of the things you hear, you will begin to uh, recognize how one aspect dovetails with other aspects in terms of controlling human endeavors. Well, from population control, a natural next step then was sex. Uh, he said sex must be separated from reproduction. Sex is too pleasurable and the urges are too strong to expect people to give it up. Chemicals in food and in the water supply to reduce the sex drive are not practical. The strategy then would be not to diminish sex activity, but to increase sex activity, but in such a way that people won't be having babies. And the first consideration then uh, here was contraception. Contraception would be uh, very strongly encouraged, uh, and it would be connected so closely in people's minds with sex that they would automatically think contraception when they were thinking or preparing for sex. And contraceptives would be made universally available. Nobody wanting contraception would be uh, find that they were unavailable. Contraceptives would be displayed uh, much more prominently in drugstores and right up with the uh, cigarettes and the chewing gum out in the open rather than hidden under the counter where people would have to ask for them and maybe be embarrassed. This kind of openness was a way of uh, suggesting that uh, contraceptions are, contraceptives are just as much part of life as uh, any other item sold in the store. And contraceptives would be advertised. And contraceptives would be dispensed in the schools in association with sex education. The sex education was to get kids interested early, uh, making the connection between sex and the need for contraception early in their lives, even before they became very active. At this point, I was recalling some of my teachers, particularly in high school, and found it totally unbelievable to think of them agreeing to, much less participating in distributing contraceptives to students. But uh, that only reflected my lack of understanding of how these people operate. That was before the school-based clinic uh, programs got started. Many, many cities in the United States by this time uh, have already set up school-based clinics, which uh, are primarily contraception, birth control, population control clinics. The idea then is that the uh, connection between sex and contraception uh, introduced and reinforced in school would carry over into marriage. Indeed, if uh, young people, when they matured, decided to get married, uh, marriage itself would be uh, diminished in importance. Uh, in, he indicated some recognition that most people probably would want to be married, but that uh, this certainly would not be any longer considered to be necessary uh, for sexual activity. No surprise then that the next item was abortion, and this now, back in 1969, four years before Roe v. Wade, uh, he said abortion will no longer be a crime. 
uh, abortion would be accepted as normal and would be paid for by taxes for people who could not pay for their own abortions. Contraceptives would be made available by tax money so that uh, nobody would have to do without contraceptives. If school sex programs would lead to more pregnancies in children, that was really seen as no problem. Uh, parents who think they are opposed to abortion on moral or religious grounds will change their minds when it is their own child who is pregnant. So this will help overcome opposition to abortion. Before long, only a few diehards will still refuse to see abortion as acceptable, and they won't matter anymore. Homosexuality also was to be encouraged. Uh, people will be given permission to be homosexuals. That's the way it was stated. They won't have to hide it. And elderly people will be encouraged to continue uh, to have active sex lives uh, into their very old ages as long as they can. Uh, everyone will be given permission to have sex, to enjoy however they want. Anything goes. This is the way it was put. And I remember thinking uh, how arrogant for this individual or whoever he represents to feel that they can give or withhold permission for people to do things. But those, that was the terminology that was used. In this regard, uh, clothing was mentioned. Clothing styles would be made more stimulating and provocative. Recall uh, back in 1969 was the time of the, the miniskirt when they were, those miniskirts were very, very high and very revealing. Uh, he said it's not just the amount of skin that is expressed, exposed, that makes clothing sexually seductive, but other more subtle things are often more suggestive. Uh, things like movement and the cut of clothing and the uh, kind of fabric, the positioning of uh, accessories on the clothing. If a woman has an attractive body, why should she not show it, was uh, one of the statements. There uh, was not detail on what was meant by provocative clothing, but uh, since that time, if you watch the changes in clothing styles, uh, blue jeans are cut in a way that they're much more tight-fitting through the crotch. Uh, they form wrinkles. Uh, wrinkles essentially are arrows, uh, lines which direct one's vision to certain anatomic areas. And this was around the time of the uh, burn your bra activity. Um, he indicated that a lot of women should not go without a bra. They need a bra to be attractive. So instead of banning bras and burning them, uh, bras would come back, but uh, they would be thinner and softer, allowing more natural movement. Um, and uh, it was not specifically stated, but certainly a very thin bra is much more revealing of uh, the nipple and what else is underneath uh, than the heavier bras that were in style up to that time. Technology. Uh, earlier he said, uh, sex and reproduction would be separated. You would have sex without reproduction, and then technology was reproduction without sex. Uh, this would be done in the laboratory. Indicated already much, much research was underway uh, about uh, making babies in the laboratory. There was some elaboration on that, but I don't remember the details, uh, how much of that technology has come to my attention since that time. I don't remember. I don't remember in a way that I can distinguish what was said from what I subsequently have just learned uh, as general medical information. Families. Families would be limited in size. Uh, we already alluded to uh, not being allowed uh, ex more than two children. Divorce would be made easier and more prevalent. Most people who marry will marry more than once. More people will not marry. Unmarried people uh, would stay in hotels and even live together. Uh, that would be very common. Nobody would even ask questions about it. It would be widely accepted as uh, no different from married people being together. More women will work outside the home. More men will be transferred to other cities in their jobs. More men would travel in the work. Therefore, it would be harder for families to stay together. Um, this would tend to uh, 
make the marriage relationship less stable and therefore tend to make people less willing to have babies. And the extended family would be smaller and more remote. Travel would be easier, less expensive for a while, so that people who did have to travel would uh, feel that they could get back to their families, uh, not that they were abruptly being made remote from their families. But uh, one of the net effects of uh, easier divorce laws uh, combined with the promotion of travel and transferring families from one city to another was to create instability in the families. Uh, if both husband and wife are working and one partner gets transferred, the other one may not be easily transferred. So one either gives up his or her job and stays behind while the other leaves or else gives up the job and risks uh, not finding employment in the new location. Rather uh, diabolical approach to uh, this whole thing. Uh, euthanasia. Everybody has a right to live only so long. The old are no longer useful. They become a burden. You should be ready to accept death. Uh, most people are. An arbitrary age limit could be established. After all, you have a right to only so many steak dinners, and so many orgasms, and so many good pleasures in life. And after you've had enough of them, and you're no longer productive in working and contributing, then you should be ready to step aside uh, for the uh, next generation. Some things that would help people realize that they had lived long enough. He mentioned several of these. I don't remember them all. Here are a few. Uh, the use of very pale printing ink on forms that people uh, necessary uh, to fill out so that older people wouldn't be able to read the pale ink as easily and would need to go to younger people for help. Automobile traffic patterns. There would be more high-speed uh, traffic lanes, uh, traffic patterns that would older people would, with their slower reflexes would have trouble dealing with uh, and thus uh, tend to lose some of their independence. Big item uh, which was elaborated some length was the cost of medical care would be made burdensomely high. Uh, medical care would be uh, connected very closely with one's work, but also would be made very, very high in cost so that uh, uh, it would simply be unavailable to people beyond a certain time. And unless they had a remarkably rich supporting family, uh, they would just have to do it out care. And uh, the idea was that if uh, everybody sees enough uh, what a burden it is on the young to try to maintain the old people, uh, then the young would become agreeable to helping mom and dad along the way, uh, provided that this was done humanely and with dignity. And then the example was uh, there could be like a nice farewell party a real celebration, uh, mom and dad had done a good job, and then after the party's over, I take the demise pill. The next topic is medicine. Uh, there would be profound changes in the practice of medicine. Overall, medicine would be much more tightly controlled. The observation was made, Congress is not going to go along uh, with national health insurance that in 1969, he said, is now abundantly uh, evident, but it's not necessary. We have other ways to control health care. Uh, these will come about more gradually, but all health care delivery would come under tight control. Uh, medical care would be closely connected to work. If you don't work or can't work, you won't have access to medical care. Uh, the days of hospitals giving away free care would gradually wind down until that was virtually non-existent. Costs would be forced up so that people won't be able to afford to go without insurance. People pay. You pay for it, you're entitled to it. It was only subsequently that I began to realize uh, the extent to which you would not be paying for it. Your medical care would be paid for by others, and therefore you would uh, gratefully accept on bended knee what was offered to you as a privilege. Uh, your role uh, re being responsible for your own care would be diminished. 
as an aside here, this is not something that was developed at that time. I uh, didn't understand at the time. But as an aside, the way this works, everybody's made dependent on insurance. And if you don't have insurance and you pay directly, the cost of your care is enormous. The insurance company, however, paying for your care does not pay that same amount. If you are charged, uh, say, $600 for the use of an operating room, the insurance company does not pay $600 on your part. They pay three or $400. Uh, and that differential in billing uh, has the desired effect. It enables the insurance company to pay for that which you could never pay for. They get a discount that's unavailable to you. When you see your bill, you're grateful that the insurance company can do that, uh, and in this way you are dependent and virtually required to have insurance. The whole billing is uh, fraudulent. Anyhow, continuing on now, um, <clears throat> access to hospitals would be tightly controlled. Uh, identification will be needed to get into the building. Security in and around hospitals would be established and gradually increased so that uh, nobody without identification could get in or move around inside the building. Theft of hospital equipment, things like typewriters and microscopes and so forth, would be uh, allowed and uh, exaggerated, reports of it would be exaggerated, so that this would be the excuse needed to establish the need for strict security until people got used to it. Uh, and anybody moving about in a hospital would be required to wear an identification badge with uh, a photograph and telling uh, why he was there, uh, employee or lab technician or visitor or whatever. And this is to be brought in gradually, getting everybody used to the idea of identifying themselves uh, until it was just accepted. This need for ID to move about uh, would start in small ways, um, hospitals, some businesses, but gradually expand to include everybody in all places. It was observed that hospitals can be used to confine people uh, for the treatment of criminals, this did not mean necessarily medical treatment uh, at, at, that, at that time I did not know the word psycho prison as in the Soviet Union but uh, uh, without trying to recall all the details basically he was uh, describing the use of hospitals both for treating the sick and for confinement of criminals for reasons other than the medical well-being of the criminal definition of criminal was not given. The image of the doctor would change. No longer would the, he be seen as an individual professional in service to individual patients. But the doctor would be uh, gradually uh, recognized as a highly skilled technician uh, and uh, his job would change. The job uh, is to include uh, things like executions by lethal injection. Uh, the image of the doctor as being a powerful, independent person would have to be changed. And he went on to say, uh, doctors that make entirely too much money, uh, they should advertise like any other product. Lawyers would be advertising too. <coughs> uh, keep in mind, this was a, an audience of doctors being addressed by a doctor. And it was uh, interesting that he would make uh, some rather insulting statements to his audience uh, without fear of uh, antagonizing us. The solo practitioner would become a thing of the past. Uh, a few diehards might try to hold out, but most uh, doctors would be employed by an institution of one kind or another. Uh, group practice would be encouraged, uh, corporations would be encouraged, and then once the corporate image of medical care, uh, as this graduate became more and more acceptable, Doctors would more and more become employees rather than independent contractors. And along with that, of course, uh, unstated but necessary is the employee serves his employer, not his patient. So that's, uh, and we've already seen quite a lot of that uh, in the last 20 years and apparently more on the horizon. Uh, the term HMO was not used at that time, but as you look at HMOs, uh, uh, you see this is the uh, way that uh, medical care is being taken over 
since the national health insurance approach uh, did not uh, get through the Congress. A few diehard doctors may try to uh, make go of it remaining in solo practice, uh, remaining independent, which parenthetically is me. Um, but they would suffer uh, great loss of income. They'd be able to scrape by maybe, but uh, never uh, really live comfortably as those who were willing to become employees of the system. Ultimately, there would be no room at all for the solo practitioner after the system is entrenched. Uh, next heading to talk about is health and disease. He said there would be new diseases to appear, which uh, had not ever been seen before, would be very difficult to diagnose and be untreatable, uh, at least for a long time. No elaboration was made on this, but uh, I remember not long after hearing this presentation when I had a puzzling uh, diagnosis to make, I would be wondering, is this what he was talking about? Is this a case of what he was talking about? Uh, some years later, uh, as age uh, ultimately developed, I think age was at least one example of what he was talking about. I now think that AIDS probably is a manufactured disease. Cancer. He said, we can cure almost every cancer right now. Information is on file in the Rockefeller Institute uh, if it's ever decided that it should be released. But consider, if people stop dying of cancer, how rapidly we would become overpopulated. You may as well die of cancer or something else. Efforts at cancer treatment would be geared more toward uh, comfort than toward cure. There was some statement that ultimately the cancer cures which were being hidden in the Rockefeller Institute would come to light because independent researchers might uh, bring them out uh, despite these efforts to suppress them. But at least for the time being, uh, letting people die of cancer uh, was a good thing to do because it would uh, slow down the problem of overpopulation. Another very interesting thing was heart attacks. Uh, he said, there is now a way to simulate a real heart attack. It can be used as a means of assassination. Only a very skilled pathologist who knew exactly what to look for at an autopsy could distinguish this from the real thing. I thought that was a very surprising and shocking thing to hear from this particular man at that particular time. Uh, this and the business of the cancer cure uh, really still stand out sharply in my memory because they were so shocking and at that time seemed to me out of character. He then went on to talk about nutrition and exercise uh, sort of in the same framework. People would not have to, people would have to eat right and exercise right to live as long as before. Most won't. Uh, this in the connection of uh, nutrition, there was no specific statement that I can recall as to particular nutrients that would be either uh, inadequate or in excess. In retrospect, I tend to think he meant high salt diets and high fat diets would predispose toward uh, high blood pressure and premature arteriosclerotic heart disease and that if people were too dumb or too lazy to exercise as they should, then their uh, dietary, their uh, circulating fats would go up and predispose to disease. And he said something about diet information, about proper diet would be widely available, but most people, uh, particularly stupid people who had no right to continue living anyway, uh, they would ignore the advice and just go on and eat what was convenient and tasted good. There were some other unpleasant things said about food. I just can't recall what they were, but I do remember of uh, having uh, reflections about wanting to plant a garden in the backyard to get around whatever these contaminated foods would be. Uh, I regret I don't remember the details. Uh, the rest of this about nutrition and uh, hazardous nutrition. Uh, with regard to exercise, he went on to say that uh, more people would be exercising more, especially running. 
uh, because every everybody can run. You don't need any special equipment or place. Uh, you can run wherever you are. Uh, as he put it, people will be running all over the place. And uh, in this vein, he pointed out how supply produces demand, and this was in reference to athletic clothing and equipment, uh, as this would be uh, made uh, more widely available and glamorized, uh, particularly as regards running shoes. Uh, this would stimulate people to uh, develop an interest in running, and as part of a whole sort of public propaganda campaign, people would be encouraged then to uh, buy the uh, attractive sports equipment and to uh, get into exercise. Again, uh, well, in connection with nutrition, he also mentioned that uh, public eating places would rapidly increase. That uh, uh, This had a connection with the family, too, as more and more people ate out, eating at home would become less important. Uh, people would be less dependent on their kitchens at home. And then this also connected to uh, convenience foods being made widely available. Uh, things like you could pop into the microwave. Uh, whole meals would be uh, available prefixed. And of course we've now seen this uh, in some pretty good ones. But this whole different approach to eating out and to uh, uh, previously uh, prepared meals being eaten in the home was uh, predicted at the time to be brought about uh, convenience foods. And uh, the convenience foods that would be part of the hazard, anybody who was uh, lazy enough to want the convenience foods rather than fixing his own also better be energetic enough to exercise uh, because if he was too lazy to exercise and too lazy to uh, fix his own food, uh, then he didn't deserve to live very long. This was all presented as sort of a moral judgment about people and what they should do with their energies. People who are smart, who would learn about nutrition, and who are disciplined enough to eat right and exercise right are better people and are the kind you want to live longer. Somewhere along in here, there is also something uh, about accelerating the onset of puberty. And this was said in connection with health, and later in connection with education, and connected to accelerating the process of evolutionary change. There was a statement that we think we can push evolution faster and in the direction we want it to go. I remember this only as a general statement. I don't recall if any uh, details were given uh, beyond that. Another area of discussion was religion. Uh, this is a, an avowed atheist speaking. Uh, and he said, religion is not necessarily bad. A lot of people seem to need religion with its mysteries and rituals, so they will have religion. But the major re religions of today have to be changed because they are not compatible with the changes to come. The old religions will have to go, especially Christianity. Once the Roman Catholic Church is brought down, the rest of Christianity will follow easily. Then a new religion can be accepted for use all over the world. It will incorporate something from all of the old ones to make it more easy for people to accept it and feel at home in it. Most people won't be too concerned with religion. They will realize that they don't need it. In order to do this, the Bible will be changed. It will be rewritten to fit the new religion, gradually. Key words will be replaced with, with new words having various shades of meaning. Then the meaning attached to the new word uh, can be close to the old word, and as time goes on, other shades of meaning of that word can be emphasized, and then gradually that word replaced with another word. Um, I don't know if I'm making that clear, but the idea is that uh, everything in Scripture need not be rewritten, just key words replaced by other words, and uh, the variability in meaning attached to any word can be uh, used as a uh, tool to change the entire meaning of Scripture and therefore make it acceptable to this uh, new religion. Most people won't know the difference, and this is another one of the times where he said, the few who do notice the difference 
won't be enough to matter. Then followed one of the most surprising statements of the whole presentation. He said, some of you probably think the churches won't stand for this. And he went on to say, the churches will help us. There was no elaboration on this. Uh, it was unclear just uh, what he had in mind when he said the churches will help us. In retrospect, I think uh, some of us now can understand what he might have meant at that time. I recall then only of thinking, no, they won't, and remembering our Lord's words uh, where he said to Peter, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So, uh, yes, uh, some people in the churches might help, and in the subsequent 20 years we've seen how uh, some people in churches have helped. But we also know that our Lord's words uh, will stand, and the gates of hell will not prevail. Another area of discussion was education, and uh, one of the things in connection with education that uh, I remember connecting with what he said about religion was... Uh, uh, in addition to changing the Bible, we said that uh, classics in literature would be changed. Um, I seem to recall Mark Twain's writings was given as uh, one example. But he said the uh, casual reader reading a revised version of a classic would never even suspect there was any change, and uh, somebody would have to go through word by word to even recognize that any change was made in these classics, the changes would be so subtle, but the changes would be such as to uh, uh, promote the uh, acceptability of the new system. As regards education, he indicated that uh, kids would spend more time in schools, but in many schools they wouldn't learn anything. Uh, they'll learn some things, but not as much uh, as formerly. Better schools in better areas with better people, their kids will learn more. Uh, in the better schools, learning would be accelerated. And this was uh, another time where he said, we think we can push evolution. By pushing kids to learn more, he seemed to be suggesting that uh, their brains would evolve and that their offspring then would uh, evolve, uh, sort of pushing evolution in, uh, uh, where, where kids would learn and be more intelligent at a younger age as if this pushing would alter their physiology. Overall, schooling would be prolonged. Uh, this meant uh, prolonged throughout the school year. I'm not sure what he said about a long school day. I do remember he said that school was planned to go all summer, that the summer school vacation would become a thing of the past, not only for schools, but for other reasons. People would begin to think of uh, vacation times year-round, not just in the summer. Uh, For most people, it would take longer to complete their education uh, to get what originally had been in a bachelor's program uh, would now require advanced degrees and more schooling. So that a lot of school time uh, uh, would be just wasted time. Good schools would become more competitive. I inferred when he said that that he was including all schools, elementary up through college, but I don't recall... Uh, uh, whether he said that. Students would have to decide at a younger age what uh, they would want to study and get onto their track early if they would qualify. Uh, it would be harder to change to another field of study once you got started. Uh, studies would be concentrated in much greater depth but narrowed. You wouldn't have access to material in other fields outside your own area of study uh, without approval. Uh, this seemed to be more, uh, where he talked about limited access to other fields, uh, I seem to recall that as being more at the college level, high school and college level perhaps. Uh, people would be very specialized in their own area of expertise, but they won't be able to get a broad education and won't be able to understand what is going on overall. He was already talking about computers in education, and at that time he said anybody who wanted computer access or access to books that were not directly related to their field of study uh, would have to have a very good reason uh, for so doing 
otherwise access would be denied. Uh, another angle was that the schools would become uh, more important in people's overall life. Uh, kids, in addition to their academics, would have to get into school activities unless they wanted to feel completely out of it. But spontaneous uh, activities among kids, uh, the thing that came to my mind when I heard this was uh, Sandlot football and Sandlot baseball teams that we uh, worked up as kids growing up. I said to kids uh, wanting any activities outside of school would be almost forced to get them through the school. There would be few opportunities outside. Now, the pressures of uh, the accelerated academic program and uh, uh, accelerated demands where kids would feel they had to be part of something, uh, one or another athletic club or some school activity, uh, these pressures he recognized would cause some students to burn out said the smartest ones will learn how to cope with the pressures and to survive. There will be some help available to students in handling stress, but the unfit won't be able to make it. They will then move on to other things. Uh, in this connection, and later on in the connection with uh, drug abuse and alcohol abuse, he indicated that psychiatric services to help would be increased dramatically. And all the pushing for achievement, uh, it was recognized that uh, many people would need help and the people worth uh, keeping around would be able to accept and benefit from that help and still be super achievers. Uh, those who could not would fall by the wayside and therefore were uh, sort of uh, dispensable, expendable, I guess is the word I want. Education would be lifelong uh, adults would uh, be going to school. There will always be new information that adults must have to keep up. When you can't keep up anymore, you're too old. This was uh, uh, another way of letting older people know that uh, the time had come for them to move on and take the demise pill. If you got too tired to keep up with your education, uh, you got too old to learn new information, then uh, this was a signal you begin to prepare to get ready to step aside. In addition to revising the classics, which I alluded to a while ago uh, with revising the Bible, he said some books would just disappear from libraries. This was in the vein that uh, some books contain information or contain ideas that uh, should not be kept around and therefore uh, those books would disappear. Uh, I don't remember exactly uh, if he said how this was to be accomplished, but I seem to recall carrying away the idea that uh, this would include thefts, that certain people would be uh, designated to go to certain libraries and pick up certain books and just uh, get rid of them. Uh, not necessarily as a matter of policy, just simply steal it. Further uh, down the line, uh, not everybody will be allowed to own books, and some books nobody will be allowed to own. Another area of discussion was laws that would be changed. Uh, at that time, a lot of states had blue laws about Sunday sales and certain Sunday activities. They said the blue laws would all be repealed. Gambling laws would be repealed or relaxed so that gambling would be increased. Uh, indicated then that governments would get into gambling. We've had a lot of uh, state lotteries pop up around the country since then. And uh, at the time, uh, we were already being told that would be the case. Uh, why should all that gambling money be kept in private hands when uh, the state could benefit from it was the rationale behind it. But people should be able to gamble if they want to, so it would become a civil activity rather than a private or illegal activity. Bankruptcy laws would be changed. I don't remember the details, but just that they would be, and uh, I know subsequent to that time they have been. Antitrust laws would be changed or be interpreted differently, or both. In connection with the changing antitrust laws, there was some statement that, uh, in a sense, competition would be increased, uh, but this would be increased competition within otherwise controlled circumstances. So it's not a free competition. Uh, I, re I recall having the impression that it was uh, like competition but within members of a club, there would be nobody outside the club who would uh, be able to compete, sort of like uh, teams competing within a professional sports league if you're in the NFL or the uh, 
uh, American or National Baseball leagues. Uh, you compete within the league, but the league is all in agreement on what the rules of competition are. Not a not a really free competition. Drug use would be increased. Alcohol abuse would be increased, and law enforcement efforts against drugs would be increased. On first hearing that, it sounded like a contradiction. Uh, why increase drug abuse and simultaneously increase law enforcement against drug abuse? Uh, but the idea is that, uh, in part, the increased availability of drugs would provide a sort of law of the jungle whereby the weak and the unfit would be selected out. Uh, there was a statement made at that time uh, before the earth was overpopulated, there was a law of the jungle where uh, only the fittest survived. You had to be able to protect yourself against the elements and wild animals and disease, and if you were fit, you survived. Uh, but now that we've become so civilized, we're over-civilized, and the unfit are and able to survive only at the expense of those who are more fit. And the uh, abuse of drugs in would restore, in a certain sense, the law of the jungle and selection of the fittest for survival. News about drug abuse and law enforcement efforts would tend to keep drugs in the public consciousness uh, and uh, would also tend to reduce uh, this unwarranted American complacency that the world is a safe place and a nice place. The same thing would happen with alcohol. Alcohol abuse would be both promoted and uh, demoted at the same time. The vulnerable and the weak would respond to the promotions and therefore use and abuse more alcohol. Uh, drunk driving would become more of a problem and strict rules about driving under the influence would be established so that uh, more and more people would lose their privilege to drive. This also had connection with uh, something we'll get to later about overall restrictions on travel. Uh, not everybody should be free to travel uh, the way they do now in the United States. People don't have a need to travel that way. It's a privilege was kind of the high-handed way it was put. Again, much more in the way of psychological services would be made available to help those who uh, got hooked on drugs and alcohol. The idea being that uh, in order to promote this, drug and alcohol abuse to screen out some of the unfit, people who otherwise are pretty good also would be subject to getting hooked. And uh, if they were really worth their salt, they would have enough sense to seek uh, psychological counseling and to benefit from it. So this was presented as sort of a redeeming value on the part of the, uh, of the planners. Uh, it was as if he were saying, you think we're bad in promoting these uh, evil things, but look how nice we are. We're also providing a way out. More jails would be needed. Hospitals could serve as jails. Some new hospital construction would be designed so as to make them adaptable to jail-like use. Nothing is permanent. Streets would be rerouted, renamed. Areas you had not seen in a while then would become unfamiliar. Uh, among other things, this would uh, contribute to older people feeling that it was time to move on. Uh, they couldn't even, people would feel they couldn't even keep up now with uh, the changes in areas that were once familiar. Vacant buildings would be left to stand empty and to deteriorate, and streets would be allowed to deteriorate in certain localities. The purpose of this was to provide the jungle a depressed atmosphere for the unfit. Uh, somewhere in this same connection he mentioned uh, buildings and, be bri and bridges uh, would be made so that they would collapse after a while. There would be uh, more accidents uh, involving uh, airplanes and railroads and automobiles all of this to contribute to the feeling of uh, insecurity that nothing was safe. Not too long after this presentation, uh, and I think one or two even before in the area where I live, we had some uh, newly constructed bridge to break, uh, another newly constructed bridge uh, defect discovered before it broke, and I remember reading 
just scattered incidents around the country where shopping malls would fall in uh, right where they were filled with shoppers. And I remember that uh, one of the shopping malls in our area, first building I'd ever been in where you could feel this vibration throughout the entire building when there were a lot of people in there. Uh, and I remember wondering at that time whether this uh, shopping mall was one of the buildings he was talking about. Talking to uh, construction people and architects about it, they'd say, oh no, that's good, uh, building vibrate like that, that means it's, it's flexible and not rigid. Well, <laughs> maybe so, we'll wait and see. Other areas, though, would be well maintained. Uh, not not every part of the city would be slums. There, there would be uh, the created slums and other areas well maintained. Uh, those people able to leave the slum for better areas then would learn to better appreciate the importance of human accomplishment. Uh, this meant that uh, uh, if they left the jungle and came to civilization, so to speak, uh, they could be proud of their own accomplishments that they made it. There was no uh, related sympathy for those who were left behind in the, in the jungle of uh, drugs and uh, deteriorating uh, neighborhoods. And then a statement that was kind of surprising, we think we can effectively limit crime to the slum areas so it won't be spread uh, heavily into better areas. I should maybe point out here, uh, these are not obviously not word for word quotations after 20 years, but uh, where I say that I'm quoting, I'm giving the general drift of what was said close to word for word, perhaps not precisely so. But anyhow, I remember wondering, uh, how can you be so confident that uh, uh, the criminal element is going to stay where you want it to stay? But uh, he went on to say there would uh, be increased security would be needed in the better areas. Uh, that would mean uh, more police, uh, better coordinated police efforts. Uh, he did not say so, but I wondered at that time about the uh, moves that were afoot to consolidate all the police uh, departments of suburbs around major cities. Uh, I think the John Birch Society was one who was saying, support your local police, don't let them be consolidated. And uh, I remember wondering if that was one of the things he had in mind about security. It was not explicitly stated. But anyhow, he went on to say there would be a whole new industry of residential security systems uh, to develop with alarms and locks and uh, alarms going into the police department so that uh, people could protect their wealth and their well-being. Uh, because some of the criminal activity would spill out of the slums into better, uh, more affluent-looking areas that looked like they'd be worth burglarizing. But, uh, and again, it was stated uh, like as a redeeming quality. See, we're generating all this more crime, but look how good we are. We're also generating uh, the means for you to protect yourself against the crime. Uh, sort of repeated thing throughout this presentation was the... Uh, uh, recognized uh, evil and then the uh, self-forgiveness saying, well, see, we've given you way out. American industry came under uh, discussion. It was the first that I'd heard uh, of the term global interdependence or that notion. Uh, the stated plan was that different parts of the world would be assigned different roles of industry and commerce in a unified global system the continued preeminence of the United States and the relative independence and self-sufficiency of the United States would have to be changed. Uh, this uh, was one of the several times where he said, in order to create a new structure, you first have to tear down the old. And uh, American industry was uh, one example of that. Uh, our system would have to be curtailed in order to give other countries a chance to build their industries uh, because uh, they would otherwise they would not be able to compete against the United States. And this was especially true of our heavy industries uh, that would be cut back uh, while uh, the same industries were being developed in other countries, uh, notably Japan.
And at this point, there was uh, some discussion of steel, and particularly automobiles. I remember saying that uh, automobiles would be uh, imported from Japan on a uh, uh, equal footing with uh, our own domestically produced automobiles, but the Japanese product would be better. Uh, things would be made so they would break and fall apart. Uh, that is in the United States. Uh, so that uh, people would tend to prefer the imported variety, and this would give a bit of a boost to uh, foreign competitors. Uh, one example uh, was Japanese. In 1969, Japanese automobiles, uh, if they were sold here at all, I don't remember, but they certainly weren't very popular. But the idea was you would uh, get a little bit disgusted with your uh, Ford, uh, GM, or Chrysler product or whatever because uh, little things like uh, window handles would fall off more and plastic parts would break uh, that, had they been made of metal, would hold up. Your patriotism about buying American would soon uh, give way to practicality that if you bought uh, Japanese or German or imported, uh, that it would last longer and you'd be better off. Patriotism would go down uh, down the drain then. There was mention elsewhere of things uh, being made to fall apart too. Uh, uh, one of the I don't remember specific items that uh, if they were even stated uh, other than automobiles, but I do recall having the impression, uh, sort of in my imagination, of uh, a surgeon having something fall apart in his hands in the operating room at a critical time. Uh, was he including this sort of thing in his uh, discussion? But somewhere uh, in this uh, discussion about things being made deliberately defective and unreliable, not only was to tear down patriotism, but to be just a little source of irritation to people who would use such things. Again, the idea that you not feel terribly secure, promoting the notion that... Uh, the world isn't uh, a terribly reliable place. The United States was to be kept strong in information, communications, high technology, education, and agriculture. Uh, the United States was seen as continuing to be sort of the, uh, the keystone of this global system, but uh, heavy industry would be transported out. One of the comments made about heavy industry was uh, we had had enough environmental damage from smokestacks and industrial waste, and some of the other people could put up with that for a while. This, again, was supposed to be a redeeming uh, quality for Americans to accept. Uh, you took away our industry, but you saved our environment. So uh, we really didn't lose anything. Uh, and along this line, there were talks. Uh, there was then discussion about uh, people losing their jobs as a result of industry and uh, opportunities for retraining, and particularly uh, population shifts would be brought about. This is sort of an aside, but I think I'll explore the aside before I forget it. More population shifts were brought, were to be brought about so that uh, people would be tending to move into the Sun Belt. Uh, it would be uh, sort of people without roots in their new locations. And uh, traditions are easier to change in a place where there are a lot of transplanted people as compared to trying to change condition traditions in a place where people grew up and had an extended family where they had roots. Uh, things like new medical care systems, if you pick up from uh, northeast industrial city and you transplant yourself to the uh, south, Sun Belt or southwest, um, you'll be more accepting of whatever kind of, uh, for example, controlled medical care you find there than you would accept a change in the medical care system uh, where you had roots and the support of your family. Also in this vein, uh, it was mentioned that uh, uh, he used the uh, plural personal pronoun we. We take control first of the port cities, New York, San Francisco, Seattle. The idea being that uh, this is a piece of strategy. The idea being that uh, if you control the port cities with your philosophy and your way of life, 
the heartland in between has to yield. Um, I can't elaborate more on that, uh, but it is interesting that if you look around the most liberal areas in the country, uh, and progressively so are the uh, seacoast cities, the heartland of uh, the Midwest uh, does seem to have uh, maintained its conservatism. But as you take away industry and jobs and relocate people, then this is a strategy to break down conservatism. Uh, when you take away industry and people are unemployed and poor, they will accept whatever change seems to offer them survival. And their morals and their uh, commitment to things will all give way to survival. That's not my philosophy. That's the speaker's philosophy. Uh, anyhow, uh, going back to industry, uh, some heavy industry would be remain uh, just uh, enough to maintain sort of a seed bit of industrial skills, uh, which could be expanded if the plan didn't work out as it was intended, uh, so that we, uh, the country would not be devoid of assets and uh, skills. But uh, this was just sort of a contingency plan. It was uh, hoped and expected that uh, the worldwide specialization would uh, be carried on. But uh, uh, perhaps repeating myself, but one of the upshots of all of this is that uh, with this global interdependence, then national identities would uh, tend to be de-emphasized. Um, each area dependent on every other area for one or another elements in, in a, its life. Uh, we would all become citizens of the world rather than citizens of any one country. And along these lines, then, uh, we can talk about sports. Sports in the United States was to be changed uh, in part as a way of de-emphasizing nationalism. Soccer. A worldwide sport uh, was to be emphasized and pushed in the United States. And uh, this was of interest because in this area, the game of soccer was virtually unknown at that time. I had a few friends who attended an elementary school other than the one I attended where they played soccer at their school, and they were a, a real novelty. This was back in the 50s. So to hear this man speak of soccer in, the, in this area uh, was kind of surprising. But anyhow, soccer is seen as a, an international sport and would be promoted, and uh, the traditional sport of American baseball uh, would be de-emphasized and possibly eliminated. Uh, eliminated because it uh, might be seen as too American. And uh, he discussed how to, uh, eliminating this uh, one's first reaction might be, well, you pay the players poorly and they don't want to play for poor pay, so they give up baseball and either go into some other sport or some other activity. But he said that's really not how it works. Uh, actually, uh, the way to break down the uh, baseball would be to uh, make the salaries go very high. And uh, the idea behind this was that uh, as the salaries got ridiculously high, there would be a certain amount of uh, discontent uh, and antagonism as people uh, resented athletes being paid so much. And the athletes uh, would begin more and more to resent among themselves uh, what other players were paid and uh, would tend to abandon the sport. And these high salaries then also could break the owners and uh, alienate the fans. And then the fans would support soccer, and the baseball fields could be used as soccer fields. Uh, wasn't said definitely this would have to happen, but if the international flavor didn't come around uh, rapidly enough, uh, this could be done. There was some comment along the same lines about football, although... Uh, I seem to recall he said football would be harder to uh, dismantle uh, because it was so widely uh, in the colleges as well as the professional leagues and would be harder to tear down. And there was something also about the uh, violence in football that met a psychological need that was perceived 
and uh, people have a need for this vicarious violence and uh, so football for that reason might be left around to meet that vicarious need um, same thing too with hockey uh, hockey uh, had more of an international flavor and would be emphasized there's some foreseeable international competition uh, about hockey and particularly soccer at that time hockey was international between the United States and Canada uh, I was kind of surprised because I thought the speaker uh, just never impressed me as uh, being at all a hockey fan and, <laughs> and I am but uh, and it turns out he was not uh, he just knew about the game and uh, what it would do to this changing sports program but in any event, soccer was to be the keystone of athletics because it's already a worldwide sport. Uh, it's South America and Europe and parts of Asia and the United States should get on the bandwagon. And all this would foster international competition so that we would all become citizens of the world to a greater extent than citizens of our own narrow nations. There was some discussion about hunting, uh, uh, not surprisingly, hunting requires guns and gun control is a big uh, element in these plans and uh, I don't remember the details much, but uh, the idea is that gun ownership is a privilege and not everybody should have guns and hunting was an inadequate excuse for owning guns and uh, everybody should be uh, restricted in gun ownership, the few privileged people who should be allowed to hunt could maybe rent or borrow a gun from official quarters rather than own their own. After all, everybody doesn't have a, have a need for a gun was the way it was put. Uh, very important with sports was sports for girls. Uh, athletics would be pushed for girls and this was intended to replace dolls baby dolls would still be around a few of them but you would not see the uh, uh, number and variety of dolls and dolls would not be pushed because girls should not be thinking about babies and reproduction girls should be out on the athletic field uh, just as the boys are girls and boys really need not be all that different uh, tea sets were to go the way of dolls and all these things that uh, traditionally were thought of as feminine would be uh, greatly de-emphasized as girls got into uh, more masculine pursuits. And uh, just one of the things I recall was that the sports pages uh, would be full of the scores of girls teams just right there right along with the boys teams. Uh, and that's uh, recently begun to, after 20 years, recently begun to appear in our local papers. The girls sports scores are right along with the boys sports scores. So all of this to change the role model of what a young girl should look to be uh, while she's growing up, she should look to be an athlete uh, rather than to or look forward to being a mother. Uh, entertainment, movies would gradually be made more explicit as regards sex and language. After all, sex and rough language are real and uh, why pretend that they are not? Uh, there would be pornographic movies uh, in the theaters, on television, and uh, VCRs were not around at that time, but it indicated that uh, uh, these, these cassettes would be available and video cassette players would be available for use in the home. And pornographic movies would be available uh, on these VCRs as, uh, as well as in the neighborhood theater and uh, on your television said something like people uh, you'll see people in the movies doing everything you can think of uh, went on to say that uh, and all of this is to to bring sex out in the open that was another comment that was made several times a, a term sex out in the open uh, violence would be made more graphic this was uh, intended to desensitize people to violence there might need to be a time when people would witness real violence and be a part of it. Uh, later on it will become clear where this is headed. Uh, so there would be more realistic violence in entertainment uh, would make it easier for people to adjust. Uh, people's attitudes towards death would change and uh, they would not be so fearful of it but more accepting of it. 
and not be so aghast at the sight of dead people or injured people. Uh, we don't need to have a genteel population paralyzed by what they might see. Uh, people would just learn to say, uh, well, I don't want that to happen to me. This was the uh, first statement uh, suggesting that the plan includes uh, numerous human casualties uh, which the survivors would see. This particular aspect of the presentation came back in my memory very sharply a few years later when a movie about the Lone Ranger came out and I took my very young son to see it and early in the movie were some very violent scenes. Uh, one of the victims uh, shot in the forehead and there was sort of a splat where the bullet entered his forehead and some blood and I remember regretting that I took my son and remember of feeling anger toward the doctor who spoke, not that he made the movie, but uh, he agreed to be part of this movement and I was repelled by the movie and it brought back this aspect of his presentation very sharply in my memory. As regards music, he made a rather straightforward statement like, music will get worse. And uh, in 1969, the rock music was uh, getting more and more unpleasant. Uh, it was interesting that just his word, the way he expressed it, it would get worse, acknowledging that it was already bad. Uh, lyrics would become uh, more openly sexual. No new sugary romantic music would be publicized like uh, that which had been written uh, before that time. All the old music would be brought back on certain radio stations and records for older people to hear. Uh, and they would, older folks would have sort of their own radio stations to hear. Uh, and the younger people, their music, as it got worse and worse, uh, would be on their stations. And he seemed to indicate that uh, one group would uh, not hear the other group's music. Older folks would just refuse to hear the uh, junk that was offered to young people, and the young people would accept the junk because it was uh, identified them as their generation and uh, helped them feel distinct from the uh, older generation. I remember at the time of thinking that would not last very long because uh, uh, even young kids wouldn't like the junk when they got a chance to hear the older music that was prettier, they would uh, gravitate toward it. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, I was wrong about that. Uh, when the kids get through their teens and into their 20s, some of them improve their taste in music. But uh, unfortunately, uh, he was right. They get used to this junk, and that's all they want. Uh, a lot of them can't uh, stand really pretty music. He went on to say the music would carry uh, a message to the young, and uh, nobody would even know the message was there. They just uh, think it was loud music. Uh, at the time, I didn't uh, understand quite what he meant by that, but uh, in retrospect, I think we know what the messages are in the music for the young. And uh, again, he was right. This uh, aspect was sort of summarized with a notion that uh, entertainment would be a tool to influence young people. won't change the older people they are already set in their ways. Uh, but the changes would be all aimed at the young who are in their formative years and the older generation would be passing. Not only could you not change them, but they're relatively unimportant anyhow. Once they live out their lives and are gone, the younger generation being formed are the ones that uh, would be important for the future in the 21st century. He also indicated all the old movies would be brought back again. And uh, I remember on hearing that, uh, through my mind ran quickly the memories of a number of old movies that uh, I, I wondered if they would be included, the ones that I thought I would like to see again. Along with bringing back old music and old movies for uh, older people, there were other privileges that also would be accorded to older folks. Uh, um, free transportation, uh, breaks on uh, purchases, uh, discounts, uh, tax discounts, uh, a number of privileges just because they were older. And uh, this was uh, stated to be sort of a reward for the generation which had uh, grown up 
through the Depression and uh, had survived the rigors of World War II. They had deserved it and they were going to be rewarded with all these goodies. And the bringing back of the good old music and the good old movies was going to uh, help ease them through their final years in comfort. Uh, then the presentation began to get rather grim because once that generation passed, and that would be in the late 80s and the early 90s, where we are now, uh, most of that group would be gone. And then gradually uh, things would tighten up and the tightening up would be accelerated. The old movies and old songs would be withdrawn. The gentler entertainment would be withdrawn. Travel, instead of being easy for old folks, uh, travel then would become very restricted. People would need permission to travel and they would need a good reason to travel. If you didn't have a good reason for your travel, uh, you would not be allowed to travel. Everyone would need ID. Uh, this would at first be an ID card you would carry on your person and you must show when you're asked for it. Uh, it was already planned uh, that later on some sort of device would be uh, developed to be implanted under the skin that would be coded specifically to identify the individual. This would eliminate the possibility of a false ID and also eliminate the possibility of people saying, well, I lost my ID. Uh, the difficulty about the skin implanted ID was stated to be getting a material that would stay in or under the skin without causing a foreign body reaction, whereby the body would reject it uh, or cause infection and uh, that this would uh, have to be material uh, on which information could be recorded and retrieved by some sort of scanner while it was not rejected by the body. Silicone uh, was mentioned. Uh, silicone uh, at that time uh, was thought to be well tolerated. It was used to augment breasts. Women who felt their breasts were too small would get silicone implants. Uh, I guess that still goes on. In any event, silicone was seen at that time as the promising material to do both, to be retained in the body without rejection and to be able to retain information retrievable by electronic means. Food. Uh, food supply would come under tight control. Uh, if population growth didn't slow down, food shortages could be created. Uh, in a hurry and people would realize the dangers of overpopulation. Uh, ultimately, uh, whether the population slows down or not, though, the food supply is to be brought under centralized control so that uh, people would have enough to be well nourished, but they would not have enough to support any fugitive from the new system. Uh, and growing one's own food would be outlawed. This would be uh, done under some sort of pretext. In the beginning, I mentioned there were two purposes for everything. One, the ostensible purpose, and two, the real purpose. And uh, an ostensible purpose here would be that uh, growing your own vegetables was unsafe, it would spread disease or something like that. So the acceptable idea was uh, to protect the uh, uh, consumer, but the real idea is to limit the food supply, and food, growing your own food would be illegal. And if you persist in illegal activities like growing food, then you're a criminal. Uh, there was a mention then of weather, W-A-T-H-E-R. This was another uh, really striking statement. He said, we can or soon will be able to control the weather. He said, I'm not merely referring to dropping iodide crystals into clouds to precipitate rain, rain that's already there, but real control. And uh, weather was uh, seen as uh, a weapon of war, a weapon of uh, influencing public policy. You could make rain or withhold rain in order to uh, influence certain areas uh, and bring them under your control. Uh, one, there were two sides to this that were kind of striking. He said, on the one hand, you can make drought during the growing season. Uh, so that nothing will grow. And on the other hand, you can make for very heavy rains during the harvest seasons so that the fields are too muddy to bring in the harvest. And indeed, one might be able to do both. There was no statement how this would be done. It was stated that it was either already possible or very, very close to being possible. Uh, 
politics. He said very few people know how government really works. Something to the effect that elected officials are influenced in ways that uh, they don't even realize. And they carry out plans that have been made for them and they think they are making, uh, that they are authors of the plans. But uh, actually they've been, uh, are manipulated in ways that they don't understand. Somewhere in the presentation he made two statements that I want to insert at this time. I don't remember just where they were made, but uh, uh, they're valid uh, as in terms of the general overall view. The one statement, people can carry in their minds and act upon two contradictory ideas at the same time, provided these uh, two contradictory ideas are kept far enough apart. And the other one, uh, the other statement is, you, uh, you can know pretty well how rational people are going to respond to certain circumstances or to certain information that they encounter. So to determine the response you want, you need only control the kind of data or information uh, that they are presented or the kinds of circumstances they're in. And being rational people, they'll do what you want them to do. They may not fully understand what they're doing or why. Somewhere in this connection then uh, was a statement admitting that some scientific research data could be and indeed has been falsified in order to bring about desired results. And uh, here it was uh, said, uh, people don't ask the right questions. Uh, some people are too trusting. Now this was an interesting statement because the speaker and the audience are all being doctors of medicine and supposedly very objectively, dispassionately scientific and science being the be all and end all. Well, to falsify data, scientific research data in that uh, setting is like blasphemy in the church. You just don't do that. Anyhow, out of all of this was to uh, on the political scene was to come the new international governing body, probably to come through the UN uh, and with the World Court, but uh, not necessarily through those structures. It could be brought about in other ways. Uh, acceptance of the UN at that time was seen as not being as wide as had been hoped. Efforts would continue to give the United Nations uh, increasing importance uh, people would be more and more used to the idea of relinquishing some national sovereignty. Economic interdependence would foster this goal from a peaceful standpoint. Avoidance of war would foster it uh, from the standpoint of uh, worrying about hostilities. Uh, it was uh, recognized that doing it peaceably was better than doing it by war. Uh, it was stated at this point that war is obsolete. And I thought that was an interesting phrase uh, because obsolete means something that once was seen as useful is no longer useful. But war is obsolete, uh, this being because of the uh, nuclear bombs. Uh, war is no longer controllable. Formerly, uh, wars could be controlled. But if nuclear weapons would fall into the wrong hands, uh, there could be an unintended nuclear disaster. Uh, it was not stated who the wrong hands are. We were free to infer that maybe this meant terrorists, but in more recent years I'm wondering whether the wrong hands might also include uh, people that we've assumed have had nuclear weapons all along. Maybe they don't have them. Just as it was stated that uh, industry would be preserved in the United States a little bit just in case the worldwide plans didn't work out, just in case uh, some country or some other powerful person decided to bolt from the pack and go his own way. Uh, one wonders whether this might also be true with nuclear weapons when uh, uh, you hear that uh, he said they might fall into the wrong hands. There was some statement that uh, the possession of nuclear weapons uh, has been tightly controlled, uh, uh, sort of implying that uh, anybody who had nuclear weapons uh, was intended to have them. Uh, 
that would necessarily have included the Soviet Union, uh, if indeed they have them. Uh, but it, I recall at the time of wondering, uh, are you telling us or are you implying that uh, that this country uh, willingly gave nuclear weapons to the Soviets? At that time, that seemed like a terribly unthinkable thing to do, much less to admit. The leaders of the Soviet Union seemed to be so dependent on the West, though one wonders whether there might have been some fear that they would try to assert independence if they indeed had these weapons. So, I don't know. It's something to speculate about, perhaps. Who did he mean when he said if these weapons fall into the wrong hands? Maybe just terrorists. We'll see. Anyhow, the new system would be brought in, uh, if not by uh, peaceful cooperation, everybody willingly yielding national sovereignty, then by bringing the nation to the brink of nuclear war. Uh, and everybody would be so fearful uh, uh, as hysteria was created about the possibility of nuclear war that there would be a strong public outcry to negotiate a peace and people would willingly give up national sovereignty uh, in order to achieve peace and thereby this would uh, bring in the new international political system. Uh, this uh, was stated and a uh, very impressive thing to hear then uh, if there were too many people in the right places who resisted this there might be a need to use one or two possibly more nuclear weapons uh, as it was put uh, this would be possibly needed to convince people that we mean business uh, and that was followed with a statement that uh, by the time one or two of those went off, then everybody, uh, even the most reluctant, would yield. He said something about this negotiated peace would be very convincing. This kind of uh, in a framework or in a context uh, that the whole thing was rehearsed, uh, but nobody would know it. Uh, people hearing about it would be convinced that it was a genuine negotiation between uh, uh, hostile enemies who finally had come to the realization that peace was better than war. Uh, in this context, uh, discussing war and war is obsolete, a statement was made that uh, there were some good things about war. Uh, one, uh, you're going to die anyway, and people sometimes uh, in war uh, get a chance to display great courage and heroism and uh, uh, well, if they die, they've died well, and if they survive, they get recognition. So that in any case, the hardships of war on the soldiers uh, are worth it because that's the reward they get out of their warring. Another justification for war uh, expressed was, uh, if you think of the many millions of casualties in uh, World War I and World War II, well, suppose all those people had not died but continued to live and continued to have babies. Uh, there would be millions upon millions, uh, and we would already be overpopulated. So those two great wars served a uh, benign purpose in delaying overpopulation. But now there are technological means uh, for the individual and governments to control overpopulation. So uh, in this regard, war is obsolete, it's no longer needed. And then it's, uh, again, it's obsolete because nuclear weapons uh, could destroy the whole universe. Uh, war, once w war, which once was controllable, uh, could get out of control. And so for these two reasons, it's now obsolete. There was a discussion of terrorism. Uh, terrorism would be uh, used widely in Europe and other parts of the world. Uh, terrorism at, at that time was felt would uh, not be necessary in the United States. It possibly could become necessary if the United States uh, did not move uh, rapidly enough into accepting the system. Uh, but at least in the foreseeable future, it was not planned and uh, very benignly <laughs> on their part. Oh, maybe terrorism would not be required here. 
but the implication being that it would be indeed used if, uh, if it was necessary. Along with this came a little bit of a scolding that Americans have had it uh, too good anyway, and uh, just a little bit of terrorism would help convince Americans that the world uh, indeed is a dangerous place, or can be if we don't uh, relinquish control of the proper authorities. There was discussion of money and banking. Uh, one statement was uh, inflation is uh, infinite. You can put an infinite number of zeros after any number and put the decimal points wherever you want. Uh, this is an indication that inflation is a tool of controllers. Uh, money was would become predominantly credit. It was already, already money is primarily a credit thing, but uh, uh, exchange of uh, money would be uh, not cash or, or palpable things, but uh, el electronic credit signals. Uh, people would carry money only in very small amounts for things like chewing gum and candy bars, just pocket sorts of things. Any purchase of uh, any significant amount would be done electronically. Uh, earnings uh, would be electronically entered into your account. It, or there would be a single banking system. It may have the appearance of being more than one, but ultimately, it basically, it would be one single banking system. So that uh, when you got paid, your pay would be entered for you into your account balance. And then when you purchased anything uh, at the point of purchase, it would be deducted, be deducted from your account balance and you would actually carry nothing with you. Also, uh, computer records can be kept of whatever it was you purchased, so that if you were purchasing too much of uh, any particular item, uh, somebody, you know, some official wanted to know what you were doing with your money, they could uh, go back and review your purchases and determine uh, what it was you were buying. There was a statement uh, to the effect that any uh, purchase of significant size, like an automobile, a bicycle, a refrigerator, a radio, or television, or whatever, uh, might be uh, have some sort of identification on it where it could be traced so that very quickly anything which was either given away or stolen, uh, whatever, uh, authorities would be able to establish who purchased it and when. Computers would allow this to happen. The ability to save would be greatly curtailed. Uh, people would just not be able to save uh, any considerable degree of wealth. Uh, there was some statement of the recognition that wealth represents power and uh, wealth in the hands of uh, a lot of uh, people uh, is not good for the, the uh, people in charge. So that uh, if you save too much, uh, you might be taxed. Uh, the more you save, the higher the rate of tax on your savings, so your savings really could never get very far. And also, if you begin to show a pattern of saving too much, uh, you might have your pay cut. People would say, well, you're saving instead of spending. You really don't need all that money. But uh, basically, the idea being to prevent people from accumulating any uh, wealth which might have long-range uh, disruptive influence on the system. People would be encouraged to... Uh, use credit uh, to borrow uh, and then also be encouraged to uh, uh, also be encouraged to renege on their debt so that they would uh, destroy their own credit and the idea here is that uh, again if you're too stupid to handle credit wisely uh, this gives the authorities the chance to uh, come down hard on you once you've overshot your credit Electronic payments initially would all be based on uh, different kinds of uh, credit cards. These were already uh, in use in 1969 to uh, some extent, not as much as now. But uh, people would have uh, credit cards with the electronic strip on it. And once they got used to that, then it would be pointed out the advantage of having all of this combined into a single credit card serving a single monetary system. Uh, and then you don't have to carry around all that plastic. So the next step would be the single card, and then the next step would be to replace the single card with a skin implant. Uh, the single card could uh, be lost 
or stolen give rise to problems, uh, could be exchanged with somebody else to confuse identity. Uh, the skin implant, on the other hand, uh, would be uh, not losable or counterfeitable or transferable to another person. So you and your accounts would be identified without uh, any possibility of error. And the skin implant, of course, would have to be put somewhere that was convenient to the scanner, for example, your right hand or your forehead. At that time when I heard this, I was unfamiliar with the statements in the book of Revelation. Uh, the speaker went on to say, now some of you people who read the Bible uh, will attach significance to this, uh, to the Bible. But he went on to uh, disclaim any biblical significance at all. This is just common sense of how the system uh, could work and should work and uh, there's no need to read any superstitious biblical principles into it. As I say at the time, I was not uh, very familiar with the uh, words of Revelation. Uh, shortly after that, I became familiar with them and the uh, significance of what he said really was striking. I'll never forget it. There was some mention also of implants uh, that would lend themselves to surveillance by providing radio signals uh, this could be under the skin or a dental implant, uh, put in like a filling uh, so that uh, either fugitives or uh, possibly every citizen could be identified by a certain frequency from his uh, personal transmitter and could be located at any time or in any place by any authority who wanted to find him. This would be particularly useful if somebody uh, broke out of prison. There was more discussion of uh, personal surveillance. Uh, one thing was said, uh, you'll be watching television and somebody will be watching you at the same time at a central monitoring station. Uh, television sets would have a device to enable this. The TV set would not have to be on in order for this to be operative. Uh, also, the television set can be used to monitor what you are watching. People. Uh, can tell what you're watching on the TV and how you're reacting to what you're watching. Uh, and uh, you would not know that you were being watched while you were watching your television. Uh, how would we get people to accept these things into their homes? Well, people would buy them when they buy their own television. They won't know that they're on there at first. Uh, this was uh, described as being by uh, what we now know as cable TV to replace antenna TV. When you buy a TV set, this monitor would uh, just be a part of the set and most people uh, would not have enough knowledge of electronics to know it's there in the beginning. And then the, uh, the cable would be the means of carrying the surveillance uh, message to the monitor. By the time uh, people found out uh, that this monitoring was going on, they would also be already very dependent upon television for a number of things. Uh, just the way people are dependent on the telephone today. One thing the television would be used for would be purchases. You wouldn't have to leave your home to purchase. You just turn on your TV and there would be a way of interacting with the television uh, channel to the store that you wanted to purchase and you could flip the switch from uh, place to place to choose a refrigerator or clothing. Uh, this would be both convenient but it also would make you dependent on the television so that the built-in monitor is something you could not uh, do without. There was some discussion of audio monitors too uh, just in case uh, the authorities wanted to hear what was going on in, in rooms other than where the television monitor was. And uh, in regard to this, uh, a statement was made, any wire going into your house, for example, your, your telephone wire could be used this way. I remember this in particular because it was fairly near the end of the presentation and as we were leaving the uh, meeting place, I said something to one of my colleagues about going home and pulling all the wires out of the house, except that I knew I couldn't get by without the telephone. And uh, the colleague I spoke to just seemed numb. He, uh, to this day, I don't think he even remembers what we talked about or, or what we heard that time, because I've asked him. 
but at that time he seemed uh, stunned. Before all these changes would take place uh, with electronic monitoring, it was mentioned that there would be service trucks all over the place uh, working on the wires and putting in new cables. Uh, this is how people uh, who were on the inside would know how things were progressing. Privately owned housing would become a thing of the past. Uh, the cost of housing uh, and financing housing would gradually be made so high that uh, most people couldn't afford it. People who already owned their houses would be allowed to keep them, but as years go by, it would be more and more difficult for young people to buy a house. Young people would more and more become renters, particularly in apartments or condominiums. More and more uh, unsold houses would stand vacant uh, people just couldn't buy them. Uh, but the cost of housing would not come down. You'd right away think, well, the vacant house, the price will come down, people will buy it. But there was some statement that, uh, to the effect that the price would be held high, even though there was uh, many of them available, so that free marketplaces would not operate. People would not be able to buy these, and gradually more and more the population would be forced into small apartments small apartments which would not accommodate very many children. Then as the number of real homeowners uh, diminished, uh, they would become a minority. There would be no sympathy for them from the majority who dwelled in apartments, and uh, then these homes could be taken by uh, increased taxes or other regulations that would be detrimental to home ownership and would be acceptable to the majority. Ultimately, people would be assigned where they would live, and it would be common to have non-family members living with you, just by way of your not knowing just how far you could trust anybody. Um, this would all be under the control of a central housing authority. Have this in mind in 1990 when the census comes out and they ask how many bedrooms in your house, how many bathrooms in your house, do you have a finished game room? This information really is personal and of no uh, national interest to a government under our existing constitution, but you'll be asked those questions and uh, decide how you want to respond to them. When the new system takes over, uh, people will be expected to sign uh, allegiance to it, indicating they don't have any reservations or holding back to the old system. There just won't be any room, he said, for people who won't go along. We can't have such people cluttering up the place, so such people would be taken to special places. And here I don't remember the exact words, but the uh, inference I drew was that at these special places where they were taken, uh, then they would uh, not live very long. He may have said something like disposed of humanely, but I don't remember very precisely uh, just the impression that... Uh, the uh, system was not going to support them when they would not go along with the system. That would leave death as the only alternative. Somewhere in this vein, he said, uh, there would not be any martyrs. Uh, when I first heard that, I thought he meant that people would not be killed, but uh, as the presentation developed, uh, what he meant was uh, they would not be killed in such a way or disposed of in such a way that they could serve as inspiration to other people the way martyrs do. Uh, rather, he said something like this, uh, people will just disappear. Just a few additional items sort of uh, thrown in here at the end, which I feel to include uh, where they belong more appropriately. One, uh, the bringing in of the new system, he said, probably would occur on a weekend in the winter, everything would shut down on Friday evening and uh, Monday morning when everybody wakened, there would be an announcement made that the uh, new system was in place. During the process of getting the United States ready for these changes, um, he commented everybody would be busier with less leisure time and less opportunity for people to really look about and see what was going on around them. Also, there would be more changes, uh, more difficult to keep up as far as one's investments. Investment instruments would be changing policies, interest rates changing, so that it would be a difficult job just to keep up with what you had already earned. Interesting about automobiles, there would it would look as though there were many, many varieties of automobiles, but when you looked very closely, uh, there would be great duplication. 
it would be made to look different with chrome and uh, wheel covers and this sort of thing. But looking closely, uh, one would see that the uh, same automobile was made by more than one manufacturer. This recently was brought home to me when I was in a parking lot and saw a small Ford, I forget the model, and a small Japanese automobile, which were identical, except for little things like the number of holes in the wheel cover and the chrome around the plate and the shape of the grill. But if you looked at the basic parts of the automobiles, they were identical. They just happened to be parked side by side uh, where I was struck with this, and uh, I was again reminded of what had been said many years ago. I'm hurrying here because I'm near the end of the tape, and let me just summarize by saying to hear all of these things said by one individual at one time in one place uh, relating to so many different uh, human endeavors, and then to look and see how many of these actually came about, that is, changes accomplished between then and now, and the things which are planned uh, for the future. I think there's uh, no denying that uh, this is controlled and there is indeed a conspiracy. The question then becomes what to do and I think uh, first off we must put our faith in God and pray and ask for his guidance and secondly I think do what we can to inform other individuals uh, as much as possible as much as they may be interested. Some people just don't care because they're preoccupied with uh, uh, getting along in their own personal endeavors. But as much as possible, I think we should try to inform other people who may be interested and, again, put our faith and trust in God and pray constantly for his guidance and for the courage to accept what we may be facing in the near future rather than accept peace and justice, which we hear so much now, it's a cliche, uh, let's insist on liberty and justice for all.